Welcome, kind listener. My name is Gentle Fox. You may not know me now, but by the end of this masterpiece, you will, and I trust you'll think of me as an old friend. What you'll be hearing tonight is an excerpt from our Twitch stream. I hope you'll enjoy that extra ambiance and my soft-spoken voice as we explore Leo Tolstoy's classic Anna Karenina. Chapter 26 In the morning, Constantine Levin left Moscow, and towards evening he had arrived at home. On the way in the train he talked with his neighbors about politics, about the new railways, and, just as in Moscow, he was overcome by the confusion of his notions, by dissatisfaction with himself, and shame at something. But when he got off at his station, recognized the one-eyed coachman Ignat with his caft and collar turned up, when he saw his rug sleigh in the dim light coming from the station windows, his horses with their bound tails, their harness with its rings and tassels. When the coachman Ignat, while they were still getting in, told him the village news about the contractor's visit and about Pava having calved, he felt the confusion gradually clearing up and the shame and dissatisfaction with himself going away. He felt it just at the sight of Ignat and the horses, but when he put on the sheepskin coat brought for him, got into the sleigh, wrapped himself up and drove off, thinking over the orders he had given about the estate and glancing at the outrunner, a former dawn saddle horse, overridden but a spirited animal, he began to understand what had happened to him quite differently. He felt he was himself and did not want to be otherwise. He only wanted to be better than he had been before. First, he decided from that day on not to hope any more for the extraordinary happiness that marriage was to have given him, and as a consequence not to neglect the present so much. Second, he would never again allow himself to be carried away by a vile passion, the memory of which had so tormented him as he was about to propose. Then, remembering his brother Nikolai, he decided that he would never again allow himself to forget him, would watch over him, and never let him out of his sight, so as to be ready to help when things went badly for him. And that would be soon, he thought. Then, too, his brother's talk about communism, which he had taken so lightly at the time, now made him ponder. He regarded the reforming of economic conditions as nonsense, but he had always felt the injustice of his abundance as compared with the poverty of the people. And he now decided that in order to feel himself fully in the right, though he had worked hard before and lived without luxury, he would now work still harder and allow himself still less luxury. And all this seemed so easy to do that he spent the whole way in the most pleasant dreams with a cheerful feeling of hope for a new, better life, he drove up to his house between eight and nine in the evening. Light fell onto the snow-covered yard in front of the house from the windows of the room of Agafya Mikhailovna, his old nurse, who filled the role of the housekeeper for him. She was not yet asleep. Kuzma, whom she woke up, ran out sleepy and barefoot onto the porch, the pointer bitch Laska also ran out, almost knocking Kuzma off his feet, and rubbed herself against Levine's knees, stood on her hind legs, and wanted, but did not dare, to put her front paws on his chest. "'You've come back so soon, dear,' said Agafya Mikhailovna. "'I missed it, Agafya Mikhailovna. There's no place like home,' he replied and went to his study. The study was slowly lit up by the candle that was brought. Familiar details emerged. Deer's antlers, shelves of books, the back of the stove with a vent that had long been in need of repair, his father's sofa, the big desk, an open book on the desk, a broken ashtray, 
a notebook with his handwriting. When he saw it all, he was overcome by a momentary doubt of the possibility of setting up that new life he had dreamed of on the way. All these traces of his life seemed to seize hold of him and say to him, No, you won't escape us and be different. You'll be the same as you were, with doubts and eternal dissatisfaction with yourself, vain attempts to improve and failures, and an eternal expectation of the happiness that has eluded you and is not possible for you. But that was how his things talked, while another voice in his soul said that he must not submit to his past, and that it was possible to do anything with oneself. And listening to this voice, he went to the corner where he had thirty or two thirty-six pound dumbbells and began lifting them, trying to cheer himself up with exercise. There was a creak of steps outside the door. He hastily set down the dumbbells. The steward came in and told him that everything, thank God, was well, but informed him that the buckwheat had got slightly burned up in the new kiln. This news vexed Levine. The new kiln had been built and partly designed by him. The steward had always been against this kiln, and now, with concealed triumph, announced that the buckwheat had got burned. Levine, however, was firmly convinced that if it had got burnt, it was only because the measures he had ordered a hundred times had not been taken. He became annoyed and reprimanded the steward. But there had been one important and joyful event. Pava, his best and most valuable cow, bought at a cattle show, had calved. Kuzma, give me my sheepskin coat, and you have them bring a lantern he said to the steward. I'll go and take a look. The shed for the valuable cows was just behind the house. Crossing the yard past a snowdrift by the lilac bush, he approached the shed. There was a smell of warm, dungy steam as the frozen door opened, and the cows, surprised by the unaccustomed light of the lantern, stirred in the fresh straw. The smooth, broad, Black and white back of a Frisian cow flashed. Burkett, the bull, lay with his ring in his nose and made as if to get up, but changed his mind and only puffed a couple of times as they passed by. The red beauty, Pava, enormous as a hippopotamus, her hindquarters turned, screened the calf from the entering men and sniffed at it. Levine entered the stall, looked Pava over and lifted the spotted red calf on its long, tottering legs. The alarmed Pava began to low, but calmed down when Levine pushed the calf towards her and with a heavy sigh started licking it with her rough tongue. The calf, searching, nudged its mother in the groin and wagged its little tail. "'Give me some light, Fyodor. Bring the light here,' said Levine, looking the calf over just like her mother. Though the coat is the father's, very fine, long and deep-flanked. Fine, isn't she, Vasily Fyodorovich? he asked the steward, completely reconciled with him about the buckwheat, under the influence of his joy over the calf. What bad should she take after? And the contractor, Semyon, came the day after you left. You'll have to settle the contract with him, Konstantin Dmitrich said the steward. I told you before about the machine. This one question led Levine into all the details of running the estate, which was big and complex. From the cowshed he went straight to the office, and after talking with the steward and the contractor Semyon, returned home and went straight upstairs to the drawing room.